See it? I clicked it. I didn't hit the check, check, test, one, two. I don't know. That's... Mark, 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 mark. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. We're so glad to have you with us. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Ross with us again this morning, as we will all through the month of January. But come February, I think it's going to start February 5th, um, Robert Cavolo from Christ Church here in Sierra Madre is going to do a four-part series. 
I think he's doing it on the theologian Abraham Kuyper. So we're going to really look forward to that. But we're going to have all Hugh most of the time for the next few months, which is wonderful. That's what this class is about. So we don't really have any announcements this morning. It's really good to see everybody. Um, all of you that are here live, tell your friends. Paradox is back live. So let's, uh, let's build this audience up like we had it. We used to have it before uh, BC, before COVID. So let's say a prayer, and we'll get to Dr. Hugh Ross. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. We live in a country where we can still speak our mind. We thank you that we know you, that we can hear your truth of the gospel, the truth of your love for us, Lord, and the truth that even intellectually, it makes sense to follow you. We thank you for this class. I thank you for this class and all it's meant to me in the last 20 plus years, Lord. We ask your blessing on Dr. Hugh Ross this morning as he teaches us and as we go our way this afternoon. Thank you so much. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Ross. Well, thank you, Ross, for that introduction. And, uh, you know, just coming from the service here at the church, uh, I was really impressed with the message from Josh Swanson. Now, you know, we need relief from the frenetic pace of the 21st century life. And he actually mentioned how in, uh, you know, South Korea, uh, you can pay $90 and they'll put you in solitary confinement for 24 or 48 hours at one of the local prisons so you can get away from all the frenetic pace of life. And I was listening to that, it reminded me of my experience at the University of Toronto, uh, where I did my graduate studies in astronomy and physics. And, uh, you know, it was a fairly high pressure situation. I mean, they really worked as hard. And, uh, you know, one of my fellow graduate students had a nervous breakdown, and so he spent some time in the uh, psychiatric hospital and one of the things about the University of Toronto, they have a 16-story building where they house all the physicists and astronomers. But immediately next door to our building was a 12-story psychiatric hospital. And the joke was we needed a corridor between the two buildings. Uh, and so I wound up visiting one of my fellow graduate students uh, in this hospital. And then right next door to him uh, was one of my physics professors. So I went in and talked to him. He was in pajamas. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, every year I take 30 days off and I just spend my time here in this hospital. And I can forget about work. Uh, nobody bothers me. I don't get any emails. Uh, I don't get any phone calls. My chairman in the physics department says that I'm getting psychiatric treatment and everybody is afraid to come and visit me. So I'm here all by myself. And this hospital's got this wonderful wood shop, wood, woodworking shop. I go down there and make furniture for my wife and my family. Uh, and, you know, I just need that 30-day break from our frenetic life, which basically emphasizes the principle of the Sabbath. I mean, one of the commands in the Ten Commandments is that we're to celebrate a Sabbath. Take a day out of your busy week to do what? to get away from all the stresses of our normal life, our work, and focus on the most important issues of life. And what I love about the book of Romans chapter 14, it basically says, it's one out of seven. If you choose to make it your day a Thursday, that's fine, a Saturday, that's fine, a Sunday, that's fine. In fact, I remember giving a lecture once to a bunch of Seventh-day Adventist uh, theologians, and I said, you celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday, but I know you theologians, you work throughout the whole Saturday. It's a work day for you. You need a Sabbath that's not Saturday, uh, where you can get away from all the stresses of your role as a theology professor. And they said, yeah, you're right. Saturday's not a day off for us. We need to take that day where we basically, and I love what Josh was saying this morning. When you do take that Sabbath, Put your phone down, put your computer down, and uh, get away from all the electronic distractions. All right, uh, last, we've been doing a series on human exceptionalism, 
And last week, I wrapped up our little series on the unique behaviors that we human beings manifest. How behaviorally, we're different from any other species that's on planet Earth today or has ever existed. We spent a lot of time contrasting uh, the behaviors and the capabilities of what humans can do compared to, say, the most advanced bipedal primates. Well, reasons to believe has now been in operation for 37 years. But I remember when we started Reasons to Believe, I interviewed some physical anthropologists uh, for a show that we were sponsoring, and every one of them said that Neanderthals are anatomically identical to us human beings. There's no difference between the anatomy of a Neanderthal and the anatomy of a human being. That was 37 years ago. Today, we know that's not true. There's radical differentiation between humans. In the scientific literature, they refer to us as modern humans, because in the anthropological literature, the term human encompasses any creature that's bipedal, reasonably tall, and uh, you know, is able to use uh, primitive tools. And so humans would refer to Neanderthals, the Denisovans, uh, Homo erectus, all number, you know, Homo heidelbergensis are all referred to as human. And so when you ever see the term Homo sapiens, it's a very broad category. A narrower category, which really isolates us human beings, is Homo sapiens sapiens. And of course, the word sapiens means thinking. The word Homo means man. And so a joke in the anthropological community, what's distinct about modern humans, we think twice. Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, but, and I talked last week about how we have the evidence for our unique thinking capability. What I'm gonna share with you uh, this afternoon is that we have an, a morphology that supports that capability for thinking, and that morphology is unique. And the term morphology in the scientific literature simply refers to the physical anatomy of, of the animal. So what I'm gonna be focusing on today is what is there about the human anatomy, Homo sapiens sapiens anatomy, that's different from the anatomy of any other creature on Earth, uh, either past or present? Well, here we go. Number one, we have a brain that's shaped very differently than the brain of any other uh, primate species. What's unique about humans is instead of having, say, in fact, we'll be doing a little series where we compare the brain of Neanderthals and Denisovans with the brains of humans. But uh, just to make a point here, when you look at the bipedal primates that preceded us, their brain structure is kind of elongated, whereas the brain structure of us humans is globular. And so rather than having a football-shaped brain, we have a basketball-shaped brain. And it's that basketball shape, that globular skull shape, that allows for room for what's called the parietal lobe. Now, there are other species that have parietal lobes, but they're small. Say, so what's the parietal lobe? It's that lobe that's in the front of your brain and a little bit back of the front, but it's that part of your brain that enables you to do mathematics, philosophy, compose complex music, uh, you know, get into logic, it's that part that supports our religious experiences. Uh, so we have a brain structure that enables us to have a large parietal lobe. And if that lobe ever gets damaged, it hinders your capability of doing mathematics and philosophy. And uh, again, we need to look at our brain as kind of like the physical interface. We humans are body, soul, and spirit, the spirit is not physical, but it's a spirit that basically controls the physical anatomy of the body. And so when you die, the spirit leaves the body. You continue to exist. And so, you know, as you age, your brain becomes less and less functional. Uh, one reason why God gave us the brain sizes that he did is the older you get, the more brain cells die. And uh, they're not replaced. Uh, but you can function quite well with only half the brain cells you had when you were 25. Uh, in fact, my younger son is a neuroclinical psychologist, and he says, Dad, my worst patients 
are these science professors that come in and demand that I test them for dementia. And he says, I give them this three hour test and tell them, you're not experiencing dementia. It's just that you're not 25 years of age anymore. Yeah, you're forgetting things. Uh, so, uh, but he says, because they're seeing their cognitive capacities decline, they think they're experiencing dementia. He says, I've yet to give a test to a science uh, professor or a scientist uh, who actually did test to have uh, dementia. But I'll tell you, there's a running joke at Caltech uh, that when they give a dementia test to one of the scientists, they can't give them the standard test you get when you go see your doctor. I mean, I'm old enough now that every time I have my annual uh, checkup, the doctor gives me a dementia test. And he asks me questions like, what are the names of your sons? Uh, what is your num home phone number? Uh, what is uh, your address? Uh, you know, what day of the week is it? Uh, you know, what year is it? But the problem is when you talk to a typical research scientist, they don't need to know what day of the week it is. So you ask them the question, you know, what day of the week it is? I don't know. Uh, every day is kind of the same. Uh, and what about your home phone number? I never call myself, so I don't know what my home phone number is. Uh, so they had to come up with a special test. And the test is this. Can you write down the Navier-Stokes equations and polar coordinates and cylindrical coordinates? And uh, I've actually got a t-shirt that has a Navier-Stokes equation on it. Very tiny little letters and it fills the entire shirt. Uh, but as I engage my scientist peers in physics, they all know the Navier-Stokes equation. And if they don't, they got dementia. So, uh, but yeah, we have this unique, uh, and then we got hand dexterity. And I'll say a little more about the hand dexterity. Uh, but there's no other species of life that has the kind of hand dexterity that we do, which enables us uh, to make the tools, the clothing, etc. In fact, I'll be talking about a major debate going on in the scientific community. Uh, did the non-human bipedal primates have adequate dexterity that they could actually weave and make baskets and clothing? And the short answer is, no, this is unique to humans. We're the only ones that have the hand dexterity that makes that possible. Number three, we have a long development time. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, Neanderthals, the evidence is that maybe it was seven to eight years between a Neanderthal being born and the time it becomes a fully functional adult. What is it for us human beings? Well, physically, it takes us about uh, 23 years, if you're a female, to become physically uh, fully capable, 24 years if you're a male. And if you're talking about your mental capabilities, for a woman, it reaches uh, that peak at 24 years of age. For men, it's 25 years of age. There's a reason why when you rent a car, they will not give you a car if you're under 25 years of age. So the car rental people are well aware that we don't become fully functional adults until we're 25 years of age. But no other animal on the planet Earth today, uh, no other animal has ever existed in the past has had such a long development time. The other thing that is unique is that uh, when we're born as a baby, uh, we are completely helpless. Uh, we need to have immediate care from our parents in order uh, to uh, survive. And uh, so, as whereas when you uh, look at a chimpanzee baby, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these National Geographic uh, uh, movies where they show a horse being born or a cow being born or a goat being born. They can get up on all fours right away and start walking. They have to because there's predators out there uh, that are gonna go after uh, these newborn uh, animals. And so these newborn animals have to be able to uh, be capable right away. That's not true of us human beings. I mean, you get a brand new uh, human being, uh, it really is completely helpless. It can't walk, it can't talk. Uh, you know, the eyes aren't yet fully developed. Um, and 
again, unique to human beings. We come out of the womb with a brain size that's only a third the size of an adult because uh, after all, there's a limit to how big of a baby uh, a woman can give birth to. And so we have this long development time uh, where we are cared for by our parents literally for 20 years before we can be on our own. And of course, with the high technology civilization we live in, it's not like it was during the medieval periods uh, when uh, your children would be expected to be self-sufficient by the time they were 17 or 18. They'd be out there uh, working and earning a living and uh, contributing to the family. Uh, and during the revolutionary era, uh, you know, people would have large families. You know, the average for the American family today is uh, slightly less than two children uh, per uh, woman. During the revolutionary era, it was 10. Uh, the average woman had 10 children. Why? Because that was a time when land was cheap and the wealth of the family depended on how much land they could cultivate. And children, even eight years of age, uh, could be put into the fields uh, to work. And so the more children uh, a couple had, the wealthier they were. And so they were motivated to have children, uh, 10 children each. It explains why in revolutionary America, they had a population that was identical to the population of Britain. And so in the, when the Revolutionary War broke out, it was between two nations, same population, same technological development, and that was a major factor in uh, the 13 colonies being able to establish uh, their independence. Uh, and today, of course, it's the other way around, especially if you live in a city. Uh, if you have a child living here in the United States, you're looking at a quarter of a million dollars you're gonna have to invest as a parent in order to get that child able to support themselves. And, you know, people know that and they say, I don't think we're gonna have too many children. And in certain parts of the world, uh, the reproduction rate is now at a level of one child per woman, which means the population is radically declining. And why is it only one child per woman? Because of the incredible expense in places like Hong Kong and Singapore of actually raising a child is beyond what many couples are able uh, to afford. So we have this long development time. In the 21st century, it's no longer 18 years or 20 years, it's more like 30 years. Uh, you know, I've got two sons that are in their 30s and uh, they're just now able to support themselves independent of my wife and I. Uh, it took more than three decades for them to reach that point uh, where we were not having to invest a lot of time and financial resources. And I've got friends who tell me, hey, it's more like 35 years, uh, even late 30s, before they can really uh, launch. So we have a long uh, development time. And here I'm just referring to the physical development time is 24 years for women, 25 years uh, uh, for men. Unique to humans is our high metabolic rate. I mean, if you look at the bipedal primates that preceded us, uh, you look at the orangutans, chimpanzees, and gorillas, uh, their body weight is the same as ours, but they don't need the calories that we need. Uh, you know, we are active all the time. And so we're not like these other animals where we spend long periods of time uh, just sleeping uh, or chewing our food. We're up and moving all the time, uh, but that means we have to be eating a lot more food. And a lot of what I'll be sharing about here is how God gave us the anatomy to be able to accumulate and gather uh, and harvest a lot of calories and a lot of nutrients. But the way our bodies are designed is that we have very high energy demands. And so you know, humans need to be eating a lot in order to maintain uh, their uh, livelihood. So very high metabolic rate, and we have a long lifespan. You know, like if you've got a chimpanzee that you're caring for in the zoo and you give them really good care, they might live 40 years. It's a lot less in the wild. Uh, the average lifespan in America today is 76 years. Uh, but those of you who are in your 70s, take heart. 
If you're over the age of 50, your life expectancy goes up to about 85. Uh, so just taking into account how you know, a lot of people uh, don't make it through uh, childbirth or don't make it through uh, the early infant years, uh, is that we have uh, a very high uh, or lengthy uh, lifespan, much greater than that of any of the large mammals that we see on the planet here. It is true that some whales can live to be 60 years, uh, but we can live easily uh, to be 80 years. And then uh, we have extreme food chewing efficiency. You'll find an article, every week I put out an article called Today's New Reason to Believe on our reasons.org website. A few weeks ago, I put up an article talking about the chewing efficiency of human beings. And this is crucial given our high metabolic uh, rate. We have to find some efficient way of consuming our food. So there's a research study that was done uh, where they were basically giving uh, humans, uh, you know, a gum, uh, you chew gum, but uh, what they did is they came up with some gums uh, that were quite soft and then gums that were extremely stiff. Uh, but what they discovered is even when we humans are working on food that's extremely stiff and difficult to chew, our metabolic rate goes up no more than 20%. Whereas what they've noticed uh, with chimpanzees, <coughs> orangutans, and gorillas, their metabolic rate can go up over uh, 50%. So this made, made them realize there's something about the human anatomy that allows us to chew our food in a very efficient way. In fact, the research study showed that in spite of humans needing so many calories and so many nutrients, way more than what the great apes need, is that we spend way less time chewing our food than they do. And so uh, the average for a human being is 35 minutes a day. We spend 35 minutes a day chewing our food but there's some that spend only seven minutes a day chewing our food. I can think of a certain relative in our family who's in that category. Seven minutes is all they need. And by the way, that relative is bigger than I am. So uh, they're needing a lot more energy than I need. And yet they're all done getting all the food that they need with just seven minutes of chewing a day. The longest that they found with humans was 72 minutes. So between seven minutes and 72 minutes, the average is 35 minutes. Then they did studies on uh, chimpanzees. And for chimpanzees, it was four and a half hours a day they spent chewing their food. Orangutans, 6.6 .6 hours a day chewing their food. The other thing they notice about the great apes is that when they're chewing their food, they're doing nothing else. What do we humans do? We're socializing when we're chewing our food. We're thinking when we're chewing our food. I mean, again, I can think of my uh, experience at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And we went to the uh, cafeteria there, and at every place at the cafeteria, they had a plate, they had the utensils. Uh, there was napkins, but they had a notepad there and a calculator uh, because they discovered if we don't provide a calculator and a notepad uh, for all these astronomers, they're going to be scribbling all over the napkins. They're going to be scribbling on the coffee table uh, and on the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the table covering. And so to prevent that from happening, they decided we're going to put a notepad and a calculator at every table there. But what was happening is that these astronomers would be solving really difficult problems while they were chewing their food. And of course, uh, what do we do? We go with our friends to restaurants, we invite people in our home for a meal, and that's what's interesting is that when humans are chewing their food, it actually enhances their socialization. What you see with the great apes is that they have to stop chewing their food in order to socialize. Uh, there's so much energy they put in chewing their food, they just focus on the chewing of their food. So we humans are designed to simultaneously think, socialize, and chew. And the chewing requires very little energy. Now, of course, there's some reasons for that. 
We don't eat the same food that chimpanzees and the great apes eat. I mean, they're predominantly eating very woody vegetation, and they really have to put a lot of energy into chewing up that woody vegetation so they can get the calories and nutrients we, they need from that. And of course, all our food is raw. Uh, we humans have the capability of cooking our food. And I mentioned this last week. We see even with the earliest evidences for human existence way deep into the last ice age, is in every case, uh, they were uh, preparing their food soaking their food, grinding their food, roasting their food, boiling and cooking their food to make the food soft enough that they could chew it with very little energy. And of course, with all this food preparation, the grinding, the roasting, the soaking, the boiling, uh, the cooking, uh, what this does is it increases uh, the caloric density of the food. I mean, just think of that, for example, raw spinach, and eating raw spinach as opposed to taking all the spinach and uh, boiling it, notice that the volume gets significantly reduced. And uh, you can consume uh, the calories and the nutrients uh, from boiled spinach a lot more efficiently you can if you eat it raw. And of course, this is true of the meat that we eat. It's true of everything that we eat. Our food preparation uh, basically concentrates the calories and the nutrients. And the other thing about human beings is that when you look at our jaw structure, our teeth, the way the saliva works, uh, the mouth structure, uh, the facial muscles that we have, they're all optimally designed to efficiently consume easy to chew food. And so it's like God right away recognized, he gave us the brain so we could immediately uh, take the food we gather, prepare it uh, so that it could be uh, chewed and consumed with very little energy, but also gave us the anatomy ahead of time. So we do not have a good anatomy uh, for chewing uh, very hard to eat food. And so we can't eat the same food that orangutans and gorillas eat because we don't have the anatomy uh, to eat that coarse raw food that's very woody in nature. But we have an amazing anatomy for being able to very efficiently uh, consume and chew food uh, that uh, is easy uh, to chew, which is why we can think and socialize at the same time that we're eating our food. In fact, our socialization is actually enhanced in eating our food, and evidently that's not going to go away in the new creation. What we see in the book of Revelation 21, when God takes us from this universe into the new creation, we're going to be feasting, we're going to have banquets, we're going to be socializing with one another while we consume food. And the interesting thing is the angels, for example, don't have to consume food. Uh, they uh, have, they're in a physical realm where that's not necessary, but it's an option. Evidently, that's the way it's going to be with us. We'll be the new creation. We will not need to consume food to sustain ourselves, but the consumption of food will be an option. And evidently, it's still going to be an enjoyable uh, option. High encephalation quotient. Now, I remember 37 years ago when I was interviewing these physical anthropologists, they would say, you are aware, of course, that the Neanderthal brain is the same size as our brain. It is the same average weight. Well, that is correct. It is the same average weight. But we humans uh, far supersede the Neanderthals in what's called the encephalization quotient. That refers to the ratio of the weight of your brain to the weight of the rest of your body. Now, just to be clear here, we're talking about what we call an optimal health body weight. I mean, here in America, we have a lot of people that are carrying extra pounds. So just think of what your optimal body weight is, and you take the weight of your brain to your optimal body weight. That's what's called the encephalization quotient. And we humans have the highest encephalization uh, quotient of any mammal that has ever existed, either present or the past. So that's where we're ahead of the Neanderthals. And of course, we have a brain structure that's very different from the Neanderthals, a brain structure that enables uh, these uh, brain lobes that are capable of high intellectual uh, function. 
Okay, number eight, a high leg to height ratio. And so we look at the Neanderthals, for example, you look at the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the orangutans, notice they have short legs relative to their full body height. Uh, this is where we humans stand apart, is that if you go from the waist down to your feet, that's most of the length in your body. That's not the case with all the other uh, primate species. In their case, most of the height is from the waist on up, and so we have a very high uh, leg to height ratio. And this is important and enables us to walk with high efficiency and enables us to walk and think at the same time. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, later. It's how, well, let me just jump into it now because I think it's important. And yeah, uh, there's an article coming out uh, on my uh, Today's New Reason to Believe that will be going into this in a little more depth. In fact, I think it's already posted, which is studies that they've done on uh, human subjects where they have them run a treadmill and they have them run on a treadmill where they attach things to their thighs and uh, to their um, calves. And what they do is they basically put random external pressures on the calves and uh, the thighs uh, so that the human subject is on the treadmill and doesn't know uh, what kind of pressure is going to be put on the thighs. And uh, so it's always a surprise. And you've got a guy there at the back, uh, you know, changing the amount of pressure. And what they notice is the human subjects don't even notice. They can keep the same pace and it doesn't matter what kind of pressure is on their legs, uh, what kind of, how much energy they have to expend. And what they also notice is no matter how they adjust uh, the pressure on the thighs and the calves, uh, the human subject automatically uh, goes into a gait that's maximally energy efficient and they do without even having to think about it. It's kind of like the way your heart works or the way the lungs work. Uh, the anatomy is all there that that all runs automatically without you thinking about it. Evidently, our walking capability is the same way. We walk, we run, uh, we go up hills, we climb, and uh, we can adjust uh, our leg muscle structure in such a way that it always maximally, uh, is maximally efficient in being able to uh, walk the terrain that we're walking. And so if you're climbing a mountain, uh, you have to make adjustments as the terrain changes, as the elevation uh, uh, rate changes, but we do it automatically without having to think about it, which explains why uh, humans are able to engage in deep thought while they're walking or running or climbing or doing a, cheap, a steeplechase uh, course, whatever. Uh, we can do that. And uh, I think you've all had that experience uh, where you're walking with your friends or running with your friends and you're actually solving challenging, difficult problems while you're walking or running or climbing. And explains why humans had such a huge advantage over the Neanderthals and uh, you know, the Denisovans. We do know that they lived at the same time and when humans invaded the territories of the Neanderthals and Denisovans, they quickly displaced them and drove them uh, to extinction. Why? Because uh, we were able as a group, for example, uh, to run across a hunting field and uh, begin to go after prey, but we could be thinking and strategizing while we're doing it. And this is not something that the chimpanzees can do uh, or the gorillas can do. They do hunt, uh, but they're not able to work out uh, different strategies and change their strategy. We humans can think and walk at the same time. In fact, uh, I'd often, uh, when I was at uh, Caltech, we would get up from our desk and our labs, we'd go outside and we would walk, five or six of us together. Because we actually determined there were times we could think better when we're walking than we're sitting at our desks or sitting around a table. And it's amazing how many really challenging physics problems were solved just by a group of physicists or astronomers going outside and going for a 20 or 30 minute walk. This is unique to us human beings uh, that we're capable of uh, being able uh, to do this. And then we have slender skeletal frames. 
And so when you look at the bipedal primates that preceded us, uh, they were uh, shorter, uh, their bodies were more uh, barrel-shaped, and so we human beings, in terms of our body structure, kind of resemble a pipe or a pencil, uh, whereas, say, with the Neanderthals, they resemble uh, like a football. And so they had a much uh, bigger uh, rib cage, their legs were shorter, their arms were shorter, uh, and we are tall and slender. And uh, this is a factor in our ability to be able to walk uh, with the energy efficiency. And so we can walk long distances uh, without expending a lot of energy. And so going on a 20 mile walk is something we humans can do. And we can do without taking a rest break. That's not true of the uh, large primates that are on the planet with us today. They're not capable of done field experiments. Yes, they're able to walk uh, through the jungle, but they're not able to walk at the pace that we humans walk or for the length of time and uh, be able to think. I mean, if you actually look at the uh, history of the Roman Empire and how they ruled a good chunk of the area around the Mediterranean Sea, the reason why is they trained their soldiers to walk 50 miles a day, carrying close to 100 pounds on their back. It's amazing to think about. The average height of a Roman soldier was five feet, uh, but they would walk four and a quarter miles per hour, which means in a period of uh, you know, 10, 11 hours, they could do 50 miles. And so they had these legions that were trained to move with all of their equipment, all their engineering implements that they needed. Uh, they could go 50 miles a day. And so something broke out in one of the provinces, uh, they could get there within a few days uh, with their legions. Humans have the anatomy to do that. And, uh, you know, this is, again, something that's unique to us that we see. And because we're slender, uh, we're able to handle heat a lot better than these other animals. Uh, you know, the taller you are, the more slender you are, the fact that we're bipedal means that very little sunlight falls upon our body and therefore we don't heat up like a horse does. I mean, a horse cannot handle the heat that a human can handle because of the fact so much more of their body mass is exposed to sunlight. Because we're slender and tall, uh, very little gets exposed uh, to sunlight. It also makes it easier for us to radiate heat away. And so we can keep cooler because uh, we have uh, that slender body frame and so if you've got a barrel-shaped body, you're basically uh, retaining a lot more uh, heat. So a slender skeletal frame. And notice we have very little body hair. I mean, take a, a human being, stand them up next to uh, a chimpanzee, and what do you immediately notice? The chimpanzee has a lot more hair than we have. And so we do have hair, but very little hair. And the fact that we have so little hair enables us to keep our bodies cool. And again, one thing that's unique about human beings is that we can keep ourselves warm by wearing clothes. And we just, you know, put on layers, take off layers. Uh, but the naked human body is ideally suited uh, for uh, operating under warm conditions. And so of all the primates, we're the most able uh, to operate under hot conditions, and even for a long period of time. And it's because we have so little body hair, it's because uh, we're uh, slender, and it's also because we have this amazing perspiration system. So as long as we have adequate water, we can keep our bodies cool, even under the hottest conditions. But I remember uh, visiting uh, Sudan uh, many years ago, and uh, you know, I said, what are all these water bottles doing in our room? And they said, well, we only have electricity for one hour a day uh, here in Khartoum. And so when you've got electricity, you fill up all the water bottles. So do we really need that many? And they said, yeah, you will really need that many because it was 120 degrees and 100% humidity. And so we were literally drinking a, a quart of water uh, several times uh, per hour just sweating it all out. But the fact that we could process water at that volume 
enabled us to keep cool in spite of those conditions uh, without uh, air conditioning. Okay, I got more I'm gonna share about our exceptional morphology uh, next week. Uh, we got a bunch more here we're gonna talk about, uh, but I'm past my 30 minutes, so I'm gonna stop there and uh, we'll take questions. And as usual, I'll take questions on any subject, doesn't have to be we talked about today, and we're gonna alternate between those of you that are here in person and those of you that are participating virtually uh, through the YouTube live streaming. I got a question here, and we're gonna get you a microphone, hang on. Can you get the microphone a little closer to you, please? Is it on? Testing, okay, now. When the human being is born, how long does it take the baby to develop the eye waking focus? How long? Well, I had the privilege of being in the delivery room with my uh, wife when both of our sons were born. And uh, I was the first one to hold our firstborn son. And what I noticed was he was just staring straight into my eyes the whole time. He was making contact with me. And right away I said, I think he's going to be a philosopher. He just seems to be so intent. He wasn't crying or anything but he was staring at everything around the room. With our second born, what I noticed was immediately he was grabbing stuff. And I says, okay, he's gonna have a personality quite different from my uh, firstborn son. And so uh, with my firstborn son, I remember when he was an infant, we could take him into uh, a supermarket and he'd be perfectly behaved. He wouldn't grab anything. Our second born, he was grabbing stuff off of all the shelves. Uh, so you can tell the personality from the very minute that they come uh, from uh, the womb. On the other hand, what I also noticed was uh, with both of our sons is that their eyes were not yet fully developed. Uh, they were looking around, staring at things, but they couldn't quite figure out uh, what it was. The other thing I noticed too is even when they were a few months old, they couldn't tell the difference between a three-dimensional object and a two-dimensional full-size cutout of that object. Their eyes were not yet capable of telling the difference. But by the time they were like six months old, uh, they, their eyes were fully developed. At that point, they could recognize small symbols. Um, I mean, one thing a lot of parents notice is before a child is even a year old, they're able to engage with a computer. And so they're able to recognize small symbols on the computer and even begin to manipulate it to get the kind of video clips that they want to get. But the eyes are not fully developed at birth. They're developed enough that they can kind of see vaguely what's going on. But I noticed with both of our sons is how intent they were at staring at different things, trying to figure it all out. And hey, after all, they've been stuck in the womb for nine months and it's dark there, and so being exposed to light for the first time. And we see this also with other mammals, uh, like, you know, with uh, rodents. When they're born, their eyes are closed, and so they're not even to able to look out. So it takes time for the eyes to develop. Is that a good answer to your question? Okay, thank you. Hi, Hugh, we have a question from our friend Doug McComb. He says, do you think that when we get to heaven, we will all have the same IQ? So when we get to heaven, will we all have the same IQ? Well, it depends on the IQ test you administer. So uh, I personally believe that when we get to the new creation, we're gonna be just as different from one another as we are right now. However, we're gonna enter the new creation without the physical handicaps we have in this life. So people say, what will I be like in the new creation? 
Well, think of what you were like when you were the most fully functional in this life. And if you were born with handicaps, think of what it'd be like if you didn't have those handicaps. So that's what it's going to be like in the new creation, in my opinion. But I think we're all going to be different from one another. And we're going to revel in our differences. I believe God made every human being to be distinct from every other human being uh, that God has ever created, past or present. And so I think one of the enjoyable things we're going to experience uh, in the new creation is getting to know one another and appreciating our differences, being a share with one another, our differences. And uh, it's kind of like, well, let me just share with you uh, one of the IQ tests I took. Uh, I was in high school and uh, uh, there was this big exam we all got to take where uh, thousands of students all over Vancouver uh, took an all-day test. Uh, it was nine hours of testing, and the idea was they were going to select the 25 uh, top science students uh, from Vancouver. So uh, I got to take this test, and uh, it was considered the Cadillac test for IQs, and it literally took three hours to go through the IQ test, and it was the psychologist administering it. Uh, but here's one thing. Uh, she gave me this test where it showed various comic strip uh, segments and uh, it was telling a story and I had to put it in the right chronological order. And so she gave me a couple of minutes to do it and said, uh, you need to try again. You got it wrong. And so I tried it again, put it in a different order. And she it gave me four tries and said, you're the only one of all the students I've tested who couldn't get the right answer. But then there was another part of the test uh, where we had to basically associate things. And I remember a lot of my peers said that was the most difficult part of the test. She shared with me I was the only one that got 100% on it. Which makes the point that when it comes to IQ, we all perform higher than our peers in some parts and lower than our peers in other parts. So in that IQ test, I got the very bottom score in one part of the test and the top score in another part of the test. I think that's the way it is in terms of our intellectual capabilities. God made us all distinct. And so, in fact, you know, there's a facility across the street from the church here uh, for doubly handicapped or triply handicapped people. And a lot of them have mental handicaps. And some of them have been here in the class and what you notice is, yes, they can't think like the rest of us do in some categories, but they way outperform us in others. And so I think the problem with David, uh, uh, you know, uh, McComb's question is uh, IQ means so much different depending who we are. It simply indicates what we're good at. We're all good at certain things, and we're all horrible at certain things, which is why we need one another. And I don't think that's going to go away in the new creation. We're still going to be able uh, to need uh, one another and appreciate one another. Dr. Ross, it's uh, very interesting when you speak about the Neanderthals. And uh, I have some curiosities. So between humans, well, first this, what continents, are there multiple continents where you could have found the Neanderthals? And then I'd like to know from your understanding, did, um, was, what type of relationship did humans have with Neanderthals? Of what time period? Were they cooperative? Uh, were they pets and masters? Or were there, was there a war? Was there a conquest? Perhaps you can answer. Get the microphone back on you. Yeah, good questions. And uh, in terms of continents, the Neanderthals uh, were in Europe and uh, Western Asia. So there were no Neanderthals in Africa. Uh, there were none in Australia, none in North and South America. And uh, yeah, the Neanderthals existed from about 300,000 years ago until about 45,000 years ago. Uh, but there's lots of evidence that there was a brief time period uh, when some humans had contact with some Neanderthals. Basically around 45,000 years ago in Southern Europe is where we see uh, that uh, evidence. 
Uh, but, and I got a book coming out on this. It'll be released sometime in 2023. But there's new evidence that shows us the population of Neanderthals and Denisovans was never very high. There weren't very many of them. Um, most anthropologists, in fact, the evidence tells us their total population level was never above 15,000 over their entire habitat. And it may have been less than 8,000. In fact, uh, they believe that the maximum number of uh, females and males that were able to reproduce, what they call the effective population, the population capable of reproduction, likely never got above 5,000 which means contact between humans and Neanderthals had to be quite minimal. There simply weren't that many Neanderthals around. Now, given their habitat area, the population density of Neanderthals uh, was 0 0.002 per square mile. Uh, so uh, the lowest population density we see of humans today is in the country of Mongolia and there we're talking three humans for every square mile. So in Neanderthals, it was 0 0.002 maximum per square mile. And this, is, this is, explains why when we look at the DNA of Neanderthals, we can see that they're highly inbred. Their population level was so low that in terms of the reproduction, uh, it was close relatives who were reproducing, simply because the Neanderthals were so dispersed and their population uh, was so low. So in answer to your question, there was contact, but there wasn't much contact. And in terms of the details of that contact, there's a lot we simply don't know. There isn't a lot of scientific evidence uh, to indicate. We do know that uh, when humans invaded Neanderthal territory, the Neanderthals quickly went extinct. Did they go extinct because of a war? The evidence is suggesting is that humans simply outcompeted them for their food, uh, mainly because we humans, uh, there were more of us, and uh, we were able to adapt to a uh, uh, cold climate. We were wearing clothes. Neanderthals were not wearing clothes. So the fact they were able to wear clothes, the fact they were able to uh, walk so much more energy efficiently means that the Neanderthals simply got outcompeted. I mean, we could get the same food that they were going after with way less energy expenditure. And so, and that's the evidence. Neanderthals were quickly driven to extinction uh, once uh, they had contact with humans. So beyond that, we don't know a whole lot. Uh, we do know from what I shared with you last week is that humans were technologically capable, whereas Neanderthals simply showed the level of technology that we see in chimpanzees today. Chimpanzees use rocks. They use pieces of wood. They use spears. They shape them. Neanderthals did all that. Unique to human beings, though, we quickly had bows and arrows. And so we're able to develop complex uh, tools and uh, weapons that the Neanderthals did not have. That would be another factor and would have caused them to go extinct so rapidly. Follow up. Follow up question I have is when you speak of their population in those n numbers, does that resemble the population of, say, mountain lions, perhaps a spread like that, or would there have been communities spread out? You know that Neanderthals were living in communities uh, because the evidence we see for the uh, Neanderthals existing 60 to 45,000 years ago, almost all that evidence, in fact, I think 100% of the evidence is in caves. So evidently they were taking advantage of caves that would actually give them some protection uh, from the weather and the elements, and they were living in small family groups. So they weren't building towns or cities. That's unique to us humans, and then we have multi-tiered uh, social structures. The social structures of the Neanderthals uh, would have been uh, families, possibly extended families, but not tribes and uh, not towns uh, or anything of that nature. And given the low population, we're probably just talking immediate families. Thank you, Hugh. We have a question from Craig McMahon. He says, recently it was reported that a wormhole had been created in a quantum computer. It's not clear to me what the nature of that wormhole 
is. Could you characterize what was produced? Okay, good question. I've actually had that question come up on my social media pages a lot. What's going on? Well, with quantum mechanics, you can get a lot of weird things happening that don't happen in the macro world. And so the Nobel Prize in Physics this year was awarded to individuals working on quantum entanglement, which is this idea you can have two particles widely separated from one another, but actually have some kind of causal connection to one another. That's the quantum entanglement. Uh, but it's all part and parcel of the quantum uncertainty principle. And the quantum uncertainty basically says there's weird causality going on at the quantum level, but we humans are not able to see uh, what's going on at the quantum. It's hidden from us. So the Heisenberg uncertainty hides from human view the causality. I mean, to give you an example, and this is from one of my uh, reasons to believe colleagues, uh, Erica Carlson, she's a physics professor at uh, Purdue University. And what she'll do with audiences, she'll take a coin and get the coin rapidly spinning like this. So uh, she gets it going and says, is it gonna land heads or tails? We don't know. We, we can't determine that ahead of time. But he says, if I slam my hand on that coin, it forces uh, the outcome. And so it'll be heads or tails. I can flip out of it and it says, so we can figure out after the effect. But while the coin is spinning, we don't know. It's hidden from our view. Uh, but when you get to the macro world, all these quantum uncertainties average out. And so whenever you look at something that's composed of even 20 uh, quantum entities, we can determine with high precision uh, what's going on because you're basically averaging out all those uh, quantum uncertainties. But this is what happened in the paper that was published by saying, we think we're seeing a quantum wormhole. And basically the mathematics all works out. Uh, but is it possible to use a quantum wormhole to transfer information? What the researchers said, no. Uh, we just know that mathematically this quantum structure can work. Can we take advantage of this quantum wormhole? The answer is no, we can't. Uh, so, uh, but people are looking at that as trying to get some more insights in trying to build uh, quantum uh, computers. So, and it's similar what we see at the macro level is that if you've got uh, two uh, black holes, and a black hole is defined as a body that's so massive and so condensed that it pulls everything in towards it once you get close enough. And at the core of the black hole is a singularity. It's where things become infinitely dense. And uh, mathematically, you could take the singularity of black hole A and attach it to the singularity of black hole B, which means you could go from one space-time realm at the mouth of one black hole travel through the wormhole and come out into a completely different space-time realm. Many of you ever watched that TV series, uh, Battlestar Galactica? Uh, that was all based on a wormhole. Uh, now, a mathematics works. If we call it a physical impossibility, because of the quantum uncertainties, the probability that two black holes will perfectly touch one another and make contact with one another, that probability is zero the probability to be stable enough for something to pass through is also zero. Uh, and so what they're finding is at the quantum level, it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, quantum mechanics permits the structure, uh, but can you take advantage of it to move from one quantum space-time realm to another? The answer is no. Mathematically possible, physically impossible. So Hugh, what was the context of the question? What happened? A computer somewhere they think opened a wormhole? Well, the, the paper that got published, this just a couple of weeks ago, was basically saying, uh, we've done this quantum experiment, uh, which really looks like we have a wormhole at the quantum level. And the paper was basically saying, this is mathematically consistent. But the paper also ended saying, it would be wonderful if we could actually use this quantum black hole to get something physically significant, like moving information from one quantum space-time realm to another. But they 
concluded the paper saying, it'd be wonderful, but it's impossible. It's physically impossible. But the math is beautiful. So that's kind of the bottom line. I have a question myself regarding your list, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, maybe you'll get to it next week, but it seems to me that one of the differences in human morphology between us and animals is that we can eat a much wider range of food, types of food, than almost any other animal. Well, we can eat a much broader range of food because of the way we prepare it. The article that I wrote on uh, the reasons.org website said, we humans were able to outcompete Neanderthals and the other bipedal primates because we greatly widened our food supply. Namely, we could harvest raw plants that were toxic and poisonous, but by treating them, we made them safe to eat. And this is true even to this day. A lot of the stuff that we would eat, if it was in its raw form, would poison you and kill you. Uh, but by boiling it and roasting it, grinding it, cooking it, you make it safe to eat. And so there's one reason why humans were able to greatly expand the range of foods that they could eat. It's because of the way they prepared the food. And uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we have a broader range than what is possible. We also have an intestinal tract that enables us to consume a wide range of food. We're omnivorous. I think I mentioned last week, our intestinal tracts are very close in design to what we see in mice and rats. And the thing about mice and rats, you know, they say of mice and rats, you can feed them anything and they'll eat it. Uh, so uh, like us, they're capable of eating a very broad range of food. Uh, whereas when we look at the Neanderthals, it seems like most of their calories was coming from meat. Uh, a little bit uh, from vegetable matter, uh, but mostly from meat. And you used to think that early humans, it was the same way. We now know that's not true. Even the earliest humans were getting most of their calories uh, from eating plant material. What we've now discovered is even the earliest humans uh, were involved in sophisticated uh, food preparation. You know, harvesting these wild plants, uh, but boiling them, roasting them, grinding them, soaking them, uh, cooking them in such a way that it made it more efficient for us to get the nutrients and the calories, but also made it possible for us to eat a wide range of foods that otherwise uh, be toxic and poisonous. We don't have any more questions online. Are there any more questions from the live audience? Come on back. This will probably be the last question. Okay. So the scriptures say that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, do we have a, a definition of what sin is and do animals sin? Okay, a couple of good questions. And yeah, the biblical definition of sin is uh, rebellion against God. What's interesting in the Bible, uh, there's a difference between the word sin singular and sins plural. Sins plural is the outcome of our fundamental self-autonomy, our desire to run our lives independent of God. And uh, so, but that's what sin is. Sin is our uh, desire for self-autonomy saying, God's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. That is sin. The outcome of sin are sins. Uh, the words that we say, the acts that we perform, the thoughts that we think uh, that are counter uh, to God's will. Uh, do animals sin? Uh, I, there is no evidence of animals sinning. Now, the reason why some people think that animals sin is because of our pets that are strongly bonded to us and are so uh, focused on desiring to please us uh, that they take on what we interpret to be sin. Uh, so years ago, I wrote an article on this about the guilty dog syndrome. If you ever had a pet dog and a dog does something that displeases you and you rebuke that dog, what does a dog do? It takes on a guilty look. Not because it's aware of any sin, the dog just knows that's what's going to make my owner happy if I take on a guilty look. So, and they've done experiments. Do wild dogs exhibit this behavior? They don't. We only see this behavior 
uh, when the animal is bonded to a human being. And the stronger the emotional bond to the human being, the more often you're going to see uh, that guilty dog uh, look. And they've done lab experiments, which basically says it doesn't matter what the dog did. And the only thing that matters is what the human owner uh, thinks the dog did. And so the dog may be completely innocent of the offense, uh, but if the human owner rebukes the dog, the dog immediately takes on the guilty look, even though the dog is not guilty. So it's all based on the fact that God designed these animals to serve and please us. So what makes a pleasure? It also explains the mean dog syndrome, because we've all met people uh, who own dogs that are vicious. Uh, but again, I wrote another article on this saying, vicious dogs are only owned by vicious people. And so a vicious man or a woman, uh, their dog wants to please them. And so the dog quickly figures out, okay, what brings pleasure to my owner is if I viciously attack other people and other animals. This is what makes my owner happy. And explains why you see in the book of Leviticus this statement that if the cow is in the habit of goring people or animals, the owner of the cow is to be spoken to and told, hey, you need to change the behavior of a cow. And if the cow persists in that behavior, the cow is to be killed and the owner is to be killed along with the cow. Making the point that the reason why the cow is behaving that way is because of the behavior of the human owner. And so if that happens, the owner is to be addressed. And if that behavior persists, it's not just the animal that needs to be disposed of, it's the human owner. Uh, basically making the point, a animals only behave that way if their human owner really is reprobate in their behavior. So it's the human's fault, it's not the animal's fault. And I remember when I would train people to go door to door in evangelism, I would tell them, look at the animals first. That will tell you what kind of people you're going to be dealing with when you meet them. If the animals are extremely warm and friendly and affectionate to you, that's probably how the owners are going to behave. But if the animal immediately attacks you and starts biting you, you better watch out for the owner. That principle uh, worked out quite well. Okay, is that it for the questions? Dr. Ross, thank you so much. Would you please close us in prayer? Prayer, sure. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege of living in the 21st century when there's so much evidence for uh, your handiwork that's been revealed to us uh, in the book of scripture as well as the book of nature. Help us to be better theologians. Help us to be better scientists to integrate the two books. And Father in heaven, too, I pray you'd help us to manage the demands and the stresses of 21st century life, especially here in America. Uh, help us, Lord, uh, to honor the Sabbath, to take regular time out of our busy schedules, uh, to retreat away from the stresses of 21st century life and focus on the most important questions of this life and the life to come. In Jesus' name, amen.